Thanks, and Deborah, over to you. OK, thank you, Daniel, and uh, good morning, everybody. And welcome to this next session of our Supergen Net Zero conference. Welcome to our session on Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy, uh, where the Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy, we'd like to share our, our research uh, across the hub. I'm going to start with just giving a little bit of an introduction uh, before we get going. So the Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy um, covers uh, offshore wind, wave and tidal energy. And uh, because all of these are important uh, technologies from the offshore renewables, uh, which will contribute together towards the, um, the renewable energy from offshore that will support our net zero ambitions. Um, and because they all uh, coexist within the marine environment, there are many synergies between them. So it seemed very sensible to bring them together uh, within a single hub. So what we're looking to do within the Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy Hub is to bring those technologies together uh, and to advance them uh, to take uh, the, the place they should within our, our energy mix of the future. We take a whole systems approach and uh, we, as the other Supergens, we're providing that research leadership for the sector, uh, bringing together and connecting people and inspiring research in offshore renewable energy. We've seen some significant advances in offshore renewable energy over the last few years. We've seen a real shift in offshore wind from uh, mainly focusing on fixed offshore wind um, to looking at, at floating offshore wind. We've seen some significant new players coming into the sector. And we've also seen some significant advances uh, in uh, wave and tidal stream energy, but also recognise the need to really keep those uh, two sort of uh, less less uh, commercially advanced uh, areas of technology, keeping them very much on the agenda because they're critical to, uh, to our eventual net zero target. Um, okay, so I think we appear to have lost Deborah, um, Lee or Kirsty. I don't know whether you could confirm that. I cannot see uh, Deborah appears to have frozen on my screen. So um, I wonder if anyone might be able to just take over in uh, Deborah's position or we just skip to the first of the presentations and maybe catch up with Deborah when she's able to return. Hi, Dan. Yeah, I think we can do that. So we'll, we'll go on to um, Beth Scott's presentation, I think. And we'll, we'll go on okay. to that. Deborah joins back again. OK, great. Thanks, Lee. Hello, my name is Beth Scott. I'm a professor of marine ecology at the University of Aberdeen, and I'm also one of the Supergen ORE Hub co-directors. What I'm going to do here today is talk about landscapes A and G. These are the research themes. A is about resource and environmental characterization, and G is about environmental and ecosystem effects. And I think you can see that's why we've combined these themes. Is in fact, they really are two sides of the same coin. Both engineers and ecologists need to understand the physical resources at a range of spatial and temporal scales. This kind of data is extremely hard to get. It's very expensive, and it really would increase our knowledge and use, usability of this data if we considered working together to collect this data. What we're doing in our core work within Supergen is we're looking at the fine scale to the large scale physical and ecosystem aspects. And this work 
goes throughout work packages one to five. And what I've got is an example of some of the information that we've collected and are using is the use of 3D hydrodynamic models. You can see running in the background there in this location, but also that there's been ADCP and acoustic fish school collection from the MyGen tidal site uh, that we're using. That's at the fine scale. At the large scale, we're looking at whole information on UK waters for offshore wind. And this is an image of all of the round four sites in which uh, offshore wind will be placed. So there's a lot of habitat there to understand and look at what is the best locations and within micro siting for pylons and for anchors, and of course the use of cables. But what we've also done is we've looked at these habitats and also in terms of wave and tide by looking at contrasting habitats and digging into the ecosystem types that are in these areas. And we've done that by using 30 years of historical data to start to understand the ecosystem types and also understand what climate change has been doing in these different regions to better be able to predict forward which regions might be changing much more drastically than others. Now what I'm going to do is go through a range of our flexi funds in these landscapes. And I'm going to start with the work looking at uh, current on wave boys. And this has been done by Samuel Draycott using tank uh, simulations and real experiments where he can then compare the measured motion of the amplitudes in these experiments and compare those to the predictions from a numerical model that includes currents. This is providing a new framework for predicting current and directional spectra from buoy motions. Next, I'm going to talk about the V-Scores project. This is run by Benjamin Williamson. This is using drones and is a very cost-effective, low-risk, rapid measurement technique. What you can do with this is use the images you can collect very rapidly from the drones to validate surface currents and use it as a mapping tool. And drones can be compared to data from ADCPs, ADVs, and, and drifters, but done much more rapidly and much more inexpensively. Also what can happen is you can translate that information from the surface you see to predict what's going on through the water column. And this sort of information can be used in the environmental aspects as well to predict things like seabirds and mammal movement in these areas. Another one called Venti, run by Marco Placidi, is looking at the fact that the atmosphere is often in a non-neutral thermal conditions. As you go up through the atmosphere, the wind resource is significantly different and it's really affected by this, but it's often neglected in many models. So they are using the metrological wind tunnel and they're producing then these outcomes of non-neutral winds and they're then putting that back in to study their effect on wind farm performances. Now I'm going to switch to some ECR projects. And this is a dual one run by James Waggett and Sean Fraser. Um, and this is using some unique ways of capturing data called your BINOCAM, which takes um, pictures of diving seabirds and looks at the foraging behavior of animals above the surface. Whereas at the same time, it's got a whole bunch of modified fish traps across the sites to be able to look at the types of animals or fish that are coming in and out and looking at both their diversity and the size ranges that are available. This is really helping us learn a lot more about how animals are behaving and why fish and mammals and seabirds are all in these areas together and so much foraging occurs. A rather new one uh, by Dr. Andrew Want is looking at the dynamic subsea power cables and how they are impacted by marine growth. We really need to understand marine growth better because it's going to impact the functionality and the vulnerability of these dynamic cables. These are going to be used, as you know, all through um, offshore renewable industries. And as you can see by the picture, a lot is going to happen when you put things in the water. And this needs much, much greater understanding than we have at the moment. And last but certainly not least, I'm going to show you uh, animation from this work by Pablo Uro that's looking at large 
eddy simulations performed by using the state-of-the-art digital offshore farm simulator, where he's investigating the really complex interactions between uh, wave and tide flow and the turbulent aspects of them. So I'm hoping you enjoyed that rather quick romp through some of the projects. There's many more to go look at. So please have a look on our um, website for these different projects and also about the core work that we're doing. And what you can do is also then look and see if your research should be up on this um, research landscape and please submit it. So hopefully that was enjoyable and we look to see you at our website soon. Okay, thank you very much, Beth. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. And apologies to everybody for my internet failing there. I think I disappeared. I'm not sure exactly how, where I was through my presentation when I disappeared, but I would like to just pick up on um, showing you a couple of slides um, uh, to introduce this area. So um, just moving through, um, we're going to look through our research landscape. We're going to have presentations from members of the core team um, in, in different areas covering our, our research. You've just heard from Beth Scott there from the University of Aberdeen. So our role in, in uh, inspiring the research, connecting people and also um, uh, promoting our research and talking to people about our research is common across all of the supergen. So we're connecting with policy. We've got the policy session this afternoon. We talked about internationalization yesterday. We talked about uh, industry uh, collaborations yesterday and the, the importance of those. And we also talked about EDI in our EDI session um, on yesterday as well, or Wednesday. Um, so within those areas, of course, supergen ORE are very active. We've just come back from uh, an outreach session at the Green Man Festival, where we were talking to the general public and a whole range of people of all ages uh, interacting with our hands-on um, stand activity around offshore renewable energy with uh, the opportunity of using a mini wave tank and actually um, converting the, the, the waves in the tank to make electricity. So that was very exciting. Um, we also, at the moment as I speak, we have a host of um, early career researchers here at the University of Plymouth uh, active in a masterclass to, uh, to teach them about uh, hydrodynamics and physical modelling in the Coast Laboratory. They've just recently had a companion masterclass um, on computational fluid dynamics delivered through, ex uh, through the University of Oxford. Um, so supporting those. And uh, then Beth mentioned our research landscape. Uh, on our website, you could come and visit our research landscape and uh, through this interactive web tool that I'm just demonstrating here, you can see we try to uh, put together all of the information uh, in a summary form and, and you're going to hear uh, about the detail of this information today. So you can see we've got 10 uh, high level research themes there that we've identified in discussion in consultation with industry and with academia across the whole of the sector and uh, within each of those what those sort of top level themes we have a number of research challenges um, those can be uh, they appear on the research landscape if you click on the theme then you can click across and get further information and further detail on each of those we're going to hear research presentations around each of these different themes um, this morning and also following what Beth just said, we're inviting people, if you have research in these areas and they're not included there, then uh, to please contribute your research information onto our, our website. So uh, that's me, stop presenting. And I'd like to hand over to, uh, to our next uh, speaker now. And this is um, Professor Richard Wilden, who's going to talk to us about our research theme B fluid structure seabed interaction. So thanks very much, Richard, and uh, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you very please, much. Yes, thanks. Um, please do put questions into the chat uh, and we'll take all the questions at the end as a panel session. Thanks. OK, so um, as Deborah said, my name is Richard Wilden. I'm from the University of Oxford. I'm one of the Supergen Hub co-directors. 
Um, so I'm going to be trying to give you a very brief overview of some of the activity going on under research challenge B, which is fluid structure seabed interaction. And broadly, what this challenge is trying to capture is the very horrible, complex environment in which we try and extract energy from, be it wave energy, wind energy or tidal energy devices. Um, what we're really uh, interested in is how we try and develop better engineering models, engineering solutions for things like this. This is an underwater turbine. It's sitting in a horribly complex place. It's got velocity shear. We've got turbulence and roughness coming off the seabed. We've got free surface waves going past it. It might operate in isolation. It might operate as a pair of devices. It might be fixed to the seabed. It might float from the surface. So we've got anchors, we've got mooring lines, uh, we've got cabling systems. And we've potentially got motions of those different support structures as well. And whilst a lot of engineering tools have been well developed for individual components of those of those systems, where we want to try and bring things together is actually developing uh, better integrated engineering models, engineering approaches in order to try and actually get some of those systems talking to each other or those modeling systems talking to each other in order to present better engineering solutions, try and reduce something, uh, reducing some of the conservatism, uh, etc. within um, uh, engineering design for, for all of those um, uh, disciplines, wave, um, wind and tidal. So I'm going to give you a little overview of some of the activities we've been doing in the core research in here, um, mainly around multi-scale modelling of uh, wind and tidal devices. I'll say a little bit about um, some of the novel device concepts um, and how we might use some of these environments a little bit differently. Um, and I will point you to um, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Byron Byrne, who's going to be giving you some interesting uh, 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 look at some of the um, exciting work we've done on wind foundations. And I'll also um, highlight some of the uh, flex fund projects that capture some of the other areas of interest, uh, cabling systems, uh, et cetera. So this is some of the work, uh, and Beth, Beth related to some of this just now, about multi-scale modelling. Really, the, the essence of this is that single devices or the environment past a single device is not the same as the environment uh, past multiple devices. And what we're trying to do is understand how uh, when we take particular site conditions, and here this is going to be some velocity shear and some turbulence, how we can use those site conditions to then understand what the flow and the, uh, and the performance and the fatigue life and then the effect on the environment is uh, through a farm of, of uh, devices. So we take those site conditions, we try and synthesize some uh, inflow conditions for large numerical models. Um, and here this is going to be some sort of turbulence field and some kind of wave field. We then put those things through high resolution numerical simulations. You saw a lovely video of one of those. Um, and then you, we can develop whole farm models and analyses for what goes on. Um, and we can develop models for the uh, uh, fatigue decay, the fatigue life of those systems, and also what happens to the flow field and the turbulence, and how that then links through to the ecology, and how that then affects um, the response of different species and how those shoal patterns might move around uh, in response to what's uh, going on and how the farm might be operated and the conditions it might face. So this is the idea. We're trying to take lots of different systems, put them together to give ourselves larger models that take you all the way from the site condition to what happens um, uh, in an engineering and um, uh, ecological sense. Another area this is move, moving above water into the more mature wind area. Um, although wind turbines are large and there's lots of them still producing huge amounts of power, making great contribution, we still have a very limited uh, or poor understanding of the energy yield um, and the uh, fatigue damage that some of these devices um, uh, undergo when operating in large farms of devices. So this is actually moving us from a single device to multiple devices. And what you're looking at in the top here, this is the Scroby Sands wind farm, uh, is it's sort of a little analysis to give you an idea of what goes on, all these little dots of wind turbines. We're going to concentrate on this one here at the centre with the, with the red cross. And all of these points are data recorded for the flow speed coming at that wind turbine in different directions. And what you can see is, depending on which direction the wind's coming from, you might have a high wind speed or a weight low wind speed because it has to transition and pass through different parts of the wind farm to get there. 
And this means that actually the, the multi the multi scale wind farm model is extremely complex and it's very, very hard to actually get detailed, accurate uh, estimates of the flow speed at the wind turbine. The forces on the on the turbine go with flow speed squared, the power delivery goes with, goes with flow speed cubed. So it's very so the, the engineering analysis is very sensitive to getting this right. And what's happened is although farm models exist, they've been developed for actually quite small farms for low power devices. And as farms have got bigger and the devices themselves have got bigger, we need to develop new models that take in new types of interactions um, between the turbines. Um, so working with partners, what we're doing here is we're using high resolution simulations. And this is the kind of thing you can see at the bottom here. This is a, a 10 megawatt rotor. Um, and using those high resolution simulations of single and interacting turbines, we can then actually try and build uh, new Lagrangian uh, wake models, enabling us to look at things like layout optimization and farm control strategies in order to benefit uh, lifetime yield and LCOE um, type estimates. Although, the, um, although those areas all relate to multi devices, even at the basic level of a single device, we still have very um, uh, challenging problems in terms of predicting the loads when, when individual devices are put in very complex flow environments. So one of the things we're doing through Supergen is we're running a community uh, leadership engagement project where we're bringing academic and industrial partners together to try and actually improve engineering models for individual devices. So what we're doing is we're doing some very uh, um, uh, high fidelity experiments in a very controlled environment of an underwater turbine in waves and turbulent flows. This is a highly instrumented device. And we're then going to ask um, uh, our community to try and uh, predict the best they can, what the loads are on these devices. And through that mechanism and then feeding back what the actual data is, we can then try and improve engineering models and put error bands around existing models. So this is a, a little sketch of the device and sort of give you an idea of the scale. This is some sort of average sized person. And we've got highly instrumented blades here. We've got uh, measurements coming out all the way along the length of the blades. You can see cutouts in here. And, there, and then we've got fi fiber brag gratings and strain gauges down the length of the blades uh, to try and get some uh, loading estimates. And this is a very live project. I've just come back from doing some of these experiments. This is the turbulence grid. We're towing through a large tank with some waves coming at the device as we push it through the tank. These are the blades. You can see the optic fibers layered into the blades down here, and they all come out, all the sensors come out through the roof of the blade. This is not quite the same experiment, but this is the kind of thing you're looking at, some underwater turbines uh, being pulled through the water. Uh, we're actually launching this, the first the workshop associated with this exercise next week, in um, which we're inviting all our participants together to start trying to simulate and understand the load experienced by um, this uh, turbine. This is an ongoing uh, project to be running for the next uh, 12, 18 months. Also, um, something about the um, uh, novel devices. Um, the environment in which um, underwater devices exist is quite different from um, uh, the air environment for wind devices. And one of the things we are trying to do is look at how we can use the constraints imposed by seabed and sea surface to actually benefit the performance of devices. It's quite a nice story. Um, you sort of loop around from theoretical modeling through experiments into uh, uh, LCOE type analysis. And by taking some very fundamental approaches combined with simulation, we can actually develop models and say we can actually extract more energy by using constraint effects between turbines. We can then go and design these, these turbines numerically. And these, these new turbines here are tested in the flow wave tab, tank up at Edinburgh. Um, and then we can see that we can get to performance differences. We can get performance uplifts from trying to operate turbines in close proximity to each other and working with partners, industrial partners, going through to try and actually work out what the difference this makes to LCOE. So at the moment, we're looking at sort of a 10% reduction in LCOE by trying to use novel devices with uh, environmental constraints to try and help us improve performance. So that's uh, an overview of some of the activities going on under Challenge B. There's, there, are, there, are, there are many more, um, and we've got uh, a whole raft, uh, I think six here of flex fund projects uh, across our community. And some of these are going into other areas I haven't talked about. You can see there's um, some uh, geotechnics modeling here, some, some piles, and there's um, uh, some wave energy converters and uh, novel devices, again, flexible uh, membranes for uh, wave energy devices. And also um, some um, uh, shared anchoring systems uh, that cover 
uh, but wave uh, wind and tidal devices as well. We've also got uh, a range of early career researcher projects. These are smaller uh, projects and these range from lots of different interactions. This is a nice one here. This is looking at how the, the wind farm feeds back into the wave environment. So that's the opposite way around, um, uh, uh, et cetera. So um, thank you for your attention and um, I will hand over to the next speaker. OK, thank you very much, Richard, and thank you so much for, for stepping in at, at late notice there. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we're going to move uh, across to theme C and F now, materials and manufacturing. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Fergal Brennan from the University of Strathclyde. Thanks, Fergal. Fergal. That's great. Thank you very much, Deborah and Richard. Um, so, yes, um, I'm Fergal Brennan. I'm also a uh, co-director of the uh, Supergen ORE. Uh, I've got a particular remit and that is the as the uh, offshore wind champion. And just to remind um, that uh, Supergen ORE looks at um, wind, wave and tidal um, power. So what I'm going to talk about briefly this morning are the research themes C and F, which are the materials and manufacturing and operations and management, maintenance and safety. And what I'll just spend a few minutes doing is just um, uh, describing some of the theme rationale and drivers, and then I'll, I'll um, just, just dip into um, one or two of the uh, flex funded projects per um, research theme just to give you a taste or a flavour for the type of exciting research that is being conducted in this area. Um, and this, the, these research themes came about through um, intensive uh, workshops with, uh, uh, with, with industry and with the wider stakeholder community. And so the purpose of this was to produce a landscape so that uh, we could inform our, um, and, uh, our and, and steer our uh, fellow uh, researchers and colleagues across the UK university landscape to uh, focus their research um, expertise, uh, capabilities and capacity towards uh, solving some of the pertinent challenges uh, that face the, um, the, the, the marine renewable energy and offshore wind sectors. Um, so specifically with respect to firstly materials and manufacturing, we had identified five specific areas, um, integrity in the marine environment and integrity as, as Richard so, um, so forcefully put it, I, I think that um, uh, you know, offshore is a hostile environment. Um, of course, we've got this um, huge potential for energy, but also our structures um, get quite a battering and, and quite a tough time. And I'll also say when we send people out there too, it, it, it's quite a hostile environment. So structural integrity is hugely important to ensure that the structures that are uh, deployed in the offshore environment are fit for purpose throughout the lifetime. And specifically, um, we, we, we look at corrosion resistance, fatigue and coatings and protections against these. Secondly, serial volume manufacture of complex structural systems. I'll come back to this in a, in a minute. Um, and then we have uh, design for safe and cost effective installation methods, new materials and coatings, recycling and reuse of composites. Um, I will just refer to the um, offshore wind sector deal where we had the industry strategy that was set out um, in collaboration, the UK government and the devolved governments in collaboration with the uh, wider stakeholder uh, community um, agreed a, a, a roadmap towards uh, 2030. Um, and that is uh, currently 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And given that we have just over 10 today and it's taken us the last 20 years to uh, design, build um, and, and, and deploy and operate um, these 10 gigawatts, we've got to quadruple what we have in, uh, in, in uh, just under nine years, which is, um, is, is, is quite a, a, um, a, a challenge. 
Um, 60% local content, hugely important. Um, so whereas we can slap ourselves on the back in the UK of being uh, currently, and probably not for long because China is fast approaching, but currently um, the largest operator of offshore wind uh, in the world. Um, however, um, the majority of that hardware, if you like, and um, is is not uh, manufactured in the UK. And there's a huge opportunity as we quadruple the amount of offshore wind and as we start to develop the uh, marine renewable energy industry, uh, we need to focus more on what can be done. So looking at the macro elements and uh, very much um, our colleagues and, and um, in Edinburgh very much looking at GVA, macroeconomic elements, but uh, this also feeds in very, very much into um, the supergen activities in promoting um, advanced and serial manufacture and volume manufacture uh, within the sector. And hugely importantly is, is the target of, of um, a third female. Uh, we cannot afford not to um, uh, benefit and utilize um, half of the uh, available resource um, to us. We need the brightest and best uh, brains if if we are to um, uh, achieve the aspirations that uh, the, the, that that um, um, are associated with uh, us tackling this uh, climate emergency. Um, the next uh, item I, I just want to mention is safety. Uh, this is these are just uh, illustrating G plus who produced the um, accident and safety statistics. And we track these on the yellow. These are the offshore wind uh, safety uh, uh, statistics uh, shown as total recordable injury rates per million hours worked um, benchmarked against um, and upstream oil and gas. Um, uh, there, there are different sectors. Um, it, all that we want to show from this is that it is a hostile environment. What we need to do is avoid putting people out there if not absolutely necessary. Um, G plus and, and the industry are working hard and you can see they are improving um, total in recordable injury rates. Uh, but everybody um, appreciates that as when it comes to health and safety, the job is never done. And uh, then the other aspect is, um, is, is the circular economy. Uh, we don't want to see this continuing into the future. Uh, glass fibre is notoriously difficult to uh, recycle. And um, I'm delighted to uh, be able to report that uh, Supergen ORE has uh, contributed significantly once we, and, and, and I will mention, a couple of the projects that are associated with this to, so that we can reuse um, the the uh, huge amounts of glass fibre that is, is, is used in both onshore and offshore wind and also for um, um, marine renewable energy devices. So here is a list under the materials and manufacturing um, uh, thematic challenge. And uh, the first one there is, 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 is as I was just mentioning, re recycle composite wind turbine blades for high performance composite manufacturing. And it, it's not just a challenge of recycling, but uh, what uh, Dr. Liu Yang is, is doing at, at Strathclyde is he is um, developing a hugely efficient way at ensuring that these can be reused also for structural applications. So uh, very often when you recycle, there's a certain amount of degradation associated with the uh, with the structural properties associated with the material. And uh, by being able to do this in a clever way, you can potentially uh, retrieve almost 85% of the structural capacity as, as what the virgin or the parent um, and material might have had. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. I simply don't have time, uh, but um, these slides will be available. And also uh, there is a, a nice description um, under each of these, these, these projects um, on the Supergen ORE website. Um, here is one from uh, an example of a, an excellent uh, review that um, was led out of uh, the University of, um, of Exeter on the current status and future trends in operation and maintenance of offshore wind turbines. And it's, it's, it, it's absolutely uh, essential that these, um, that these broad reviews are, are conducted so that we appreciate the baseline from which we operate. 
This is a, another exciting development from a flex fund project that was funded uh, from colleagues at um, Cranfield University. And this is using additive manufacturing. And to those of you who aren't so close to this area, this is like 3D printing. And it is 3D printing uh, potentially for the repair of offshore wind structures. So um, if uh, we can uh, go out there and use our autonomous um, and remotely deployed inspection methods and we find defects, we can simply send out a, a, a 3D printing type device and, uh, and repair that, that um, uh, um, uh, component or structure in situ. And that then helps us extend the lifetime and, uh, and, 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 and the, the, the usable value of, of that high value asset. And then with respect to research theme F, which is the uh, operations management, maintenance and safety, which is very much a, a continuation and re related aspect uh, to, to what I was just uh, uh, discussing. Um, the flex fund uh, projects that, that, that uh, we funded through here was the one that was led out of uh, York University, uh, autonomous biometric robot fish for offshore wind farming inspection. Um, we also have the satellite climate observation for offshore renewable energy cost reduction led out of the um, University of Edinburgh with Strathclyde and others contributing um, and also um, a couple of uh, uh, super projects from uh, the from from Exeter. Um, just very quickly, this is uh, the uh, the satellite um, uh, data um, and this is really to um, look at both short term and, and medium term and longer term uh, predictions of um, the, uh, the, the, the local uh, environmental conditions uh, that uh, our marine renewable energy and offshore wind devices um, are, are, are likely to experience. Um, as Richard said, um, there's a great deal of uncertainty associated with um, knowing precisely what the local um, uh, conditions are um, and uh, the more and more knowledge that we can get, we can better prepare, we can better design, but also we can um, ensure that our control systems are ready for, uh, for, for, for the um, environmental and weather conditions that uh, we're likely to experience. Um, and then lastly, but, but certainly not by least, uh, this is the, um, uh, the project on the robo fish, if you like, the bio-inspired uh, bio autonomous underwater vehicle. And again, you can see what the motivation for all of this is, is that if we can replace humans, if we can replace uh, putting people out into this hostile offshore environment, um, then that will in, in turn mean that this is a safer, um, more responsible sector. And and not least, this also fits into the macroeconomics, because as I say to people is when they complain about uh, removing people and they say they'll lose jobs, we, uh, my view is very much that we should not be training technicians to repair offshore wind and marine renewable energy devices. We should be training people to repair the robots that will repair the, uh, the, the offshore wind and marine renewable energy devices. So I think that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fergal. Um, very nice overview of that area of the work. Um, <clears throat> and I'd just like to remind everybody that we, uh, so through the Supergen ORE Hub, we are supporting uh, research through our flexible fund scheme. Um, that is uh, research projects of up to 100,000 um, EPSRC support. We funded 30 of those, and you're hearing about those as we go through. So we've invested 3 million uh, in flexible funded projects. And within those, we have uh, secured 2.6 million in industry match. So they're very much collaborative with industry. Um, then we also have our early career researcher research fund, <clears throat> and that is a level of 5K EPSRC contribution for pro per project. And in that area, we funded 25 projects with a total of 130,000. Um, and again, you're hearing about those projects. So we're, we're, we're presenting across the whole range. Um, and I'd also like to mention, we, you, you may have seen in the chat, we're having some problems with the chat. 
Uh, we'd like to take your questions. We'd like to discuss the questions as a panel at the end of the session. Um, but uh, we're having some problems with the chat. You can, I think, work around it by going through the calendar invite on Teams, or alternatively, please could you email questions to the Supergen uh, ORE Hub email address, which is which Kirsty has posted in the chat. OK, so thank you very much indeed, Fergal. And now we'll move on to uh, the next presenter. This is Professor Zhao Wei Zhao uh, from the University of Warwick, and he's going to talk to us about Research Theme D, which is Sensing Control and Electromechanics, and F, O and M. Uh, thank you, thank you, Deborah. Um, hello, um, everyone. Uh, I'm Xiao Wei uh, from uh, University of Warwick. I'm also one of the co-directors of the CPGEN uh, ORE Hub. So I'll share my screen now. Okay. Uh, it seems got some problem. Oh, what happened? Okay, it works now. Uh, I will give an um, overview on the research theme uh, D, sensoring control and uh, electromechanics. Um, this research theme mainly uh, including four research areas. I'm going to briefly introduce them with examples uh, from uh, recent work of the hub. Uh, the first area is control of ORE farms, which is to develop and validate control technology for ORE farms to uh, balance the competing requirements such as maximi maximizing power generation, reducing fatigue load, and minimizing environment impact. Next, I'm going to give you several examples uh, in this area uh, at both farm level and the turbine level. Uh, this slide is about our recent work regarding intelligent wind farm control while deep re reinforcement learning. As shown in this uh, uh, photo, um, the power generation process of the upstream turbine leads to wicks, which significantly influence the power generation of the downstream turbines, and therefore influence the whole farm's power generation. This issue has drawn wide attention, but uh, existing wind farm control methods are usually model-based. In practice, it is very difficult to derive a control design model with reasonable accuracy and dimension for the farm level control design. So the existing model based wind farm control methods commonly lack adaptability and robustness to modern error and the stochastic environment conditions. Uh, in this project, we designed a deep reinforcement learning uh, based control algorithm to address these challenges. The algorithm uh, allow us to employ only the available data measured uh, at the turbine rotor um, including the uh, wind speed and the power output to learn the black box information. And our method is totally model free, which does not rely on any analytical models. It has a strong adaptability to the modern error and the robustness to stochastic environment. So we tested our algorithm uh, with different uh, dynamic wind farm simulations as shown here. The results indicate that uh, over 30% of the farm level power generation increase compared to the conventional greedy strategy, and all method performance uh, surpassed other advanced uh, control methods such as uh, uh, nonlinear MPC and uh, uh, another um, very popular reinforcement learning algorithm, DDPG. Um, now let's look at some results at the turbine uh, level. This slide is about vibration and power regulation control of a floating wind turbine. The motion of the offshore wind turbine platform can be can cause big issue um, to the turbine structure and power generation. Thus, its vibration reduction is very important. The traditional pitch control is effective for vibration reduction at the expense of interfering with the uh, power generation. 
So in this project, we developed a LPV pitch controller for the floating uh, wind turbine, which can tackle the power regulation and the platform vibration in a synthetic manner. Um, this slide uh, shows some results on structure control of very large floating structure platform. The very large floating structure can allow for the operation of multiple uh, turbines. However, like the standard platform mentioned in the previous slide, the structure uh, vibration is a major concern of this very large floating platform. But apparently here, it is not realistic to use blade pitch control for the vibration reduction. So we um, employed the tilt mass dampers to mitigate the vibration of this type O platform, which achieved a 33% vibration reduction with tilt mass damper weighted around 4% of the whole um, platform. The second area within CMD is the smart sensor system used, which is to identify, evaluate, and validate sensor technology, data transmission, in, uh, integration, and uh, interpretation system to support the improved control and the management. An ongoing work within the hub is looking at the sensor distributed across OIE structure, uh, particularly the wind uh, and the tidal turbine blades for a number of applications such as uh, defect detection, manufacturing process monitoring, and control. This work is led by Professor James Gilbert at the University of Hull. Uh, the example shows a 1.6 meter uh, tidal turbine blade with 24 fiber optic uh, strain sensors. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it was designed and manufactured by uh, Oxford University, as shown by Richard just now. In initial results show that it is able to monitor different loading conditions. Another ongoing uh, work in this area is a flexible fund project led by uh, Professor James Windmill from University of Strathclyde. This project designs and manufactures a 3D printed uh, piezo electric sensor and explores its feasibility in providing partial discharge de detection capacity for large scale floating uh, arrays. Um, uh, the next example uh, is about how to use uh, the sensor the data. Um, with measured data and physically informed deep learning, we can reconstruct the whole flow field in front of wind turbine. Um, I'll show you two videos. Um, so this is ground truth and uh, this is a predict uh, 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 flow field. So these two videos show that, um, shows a comparison between the ground truth and the reconstruct flow field. You can see they agree very well um, the traditional uh, machine learning method can only predict the wind velocity where there are measurement. So this this dot uh, place there are measurement. Um, but all method can predict the uh, the wind velocity in the whole flow field anywhere in the whole flow field, because uh, uh, all machine learning method is uh, physics based. Mm. The third area within CMD is about the uh, drive train design, which is uh, which is about the conception, design, and the validation of novel drive train for OIE device, including hydraulic device, uh, drives and the direct drive generators. An example regarding the hydraulic drive train is, uh, is that we studied the power generation control and the grid uh, integration of the hydraulic transmission, uh, wind and the tidal turbines. Uh, an, ex an example uh, regarding the dark drive generator is a flexible fund project led by Professor Lester McDonald from University of Strathclyde. This project is uh, developing a digital twin technology <clears throat> uh, which combines transfer learning and the physical mod uh, uh, modeling for the dark drive power chain conditional uh, monitoring. Um, the, the final area within CMD is a power electric conversion. 
which focus on improving the power electronic converter in order to improve the system reliability and performance. Uh, one example in this area is a flexible fund project led by Professor um, uh, Li Ran from University of Warwick. This project is to develop a technology to provide a transit overload capacity to power semiconductor in the converter or, uh, OIE uh, um, system. This has been demonstrated by integrating uh, the liquid metal phase change material into the uh, the package of the of the power module. The power module can now be overloaded to 240% of the rated current for at least three seconds. This fully satisfies the requirement of the grid support during a short circuit fault. Simulation shows that the fatigue stress uh, uh, in the pitch mechanic, uh, mechanism of offshore wind turbine can be reduced by around 10% by using a simple on-off control mode of the overload capacity to allow cooling. The ongoing work to combine this capacity with the pitch control itself could show more uh, effectiveness. Um, I, I, I believe Professor uh, uh, Li Zhang will show this uh, a new re result in the next uh, uh, assembly. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Xiao Wei. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much for that uh, that overview of the theme. That's really really interesting and great to see those new uh, research projects coming through. Um, let's um, thank you for that, Xiao Wei. Let's move to the the next presentation now. And as I said before, we're going to take the questions all together at the end. Um, so we'll have a panel session at the end and, and take questions then. Uh, please do email them to the Supergen uh, ORE Hub email address, which is in the chat. Uh, because we're having some problems with the chat. So now I'd like to introduce Professor Byron Byrne from the University of Oxford, who's going to talk to us about research theme E, survivability, reliability and design. Over to you, Byron. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. I hope you can see my slides. So Yes, yeah, all good. Good. So I'm Professor of Engineering at the University of Oxford with a special interest in geotechnical engineering, which is really about the ground and structural interaction with the ground. And for this problem, it's about the design of foundations. Uh, I'm going to talk more widely than that. Uh, I'm also responsible with Richard Wilden for the ECR activities, and we've been uh, very keen to hand out the ECR funds. And, and as you've seen through the talks, there's been a number of very interesting early career researcher projects. So I'm going to talk a bit about our work on survivability, reliability and design, and it interacts a little bit with theme B, where uh, Richard talked about fluid structure, seabed interaction. But what we're trying to do is, is take a more of a holistic view across different devices, uh, different um, energy generation activities, uh, and looking at where the synergies lie and where individual um, techniques are required rather than things that can spread across. Now, of course, offshore renewable energy can build on many years of experience and expertise from the oil and gas sector. However, uh, the problem does differ quite a lot. And so there are new techniques that are needed um, specifically for ORE and specifically to look at um, the, the sort of design for, for example, the, the floating wind problem where uh, where you may have many, many devices across a, a large site. Um, and so you need to, to have individual designs for each of the devices, but then optimise that across the whole site. And then you need to uh, be concerned about the fact that the environmental conditions across the site, which is very large, can differ um, quite a bit particularly, for example, that the soil profiles can change across a site, which might be many hundred kilometres uh, across, and, and even the water depths could vary. So there's there's areas where you need optimization at an individual location, but you also need to optimise across the site. And, and we're trying to explore techniques for um, developing those design uh, approaches. Um, one of the things that we're really interested in is design for extremes, um, because that really controls a lot of uh, the design uh, condition. And 
one of the approaches that we're looking to to develop further are, are probabilistic approaches um, so that we can try to assess you know what is the one in 25 what is the one in 50 year uh, calculation required looking at probability of failure of, of components and of systems and so on uh, now on this slide i show a number of different designs from fixed structures floating wind structures underwater turbines a point absorber uh, a sort of hinged raft type um, uh, marine energy or wave energy device. Uh, we've got an anchoring system here. We've got a mooring line and some sort of foundation device. Uh, here we've got an anchor in the ground. We could also have a, a fixed foundation such as a driven pile. All of these areas have been ex are being explored by the hub. And we're also looking at all of these different ideas uh, around the design. So um, we need to consider things like the whole life of the design. What happens at end of life? Do we decommission? Can we repower? And so on. So we need to, to bring that into the, into the thinking. Um, I've talked a little bit about extremes. We've got to design for extreme. We've got to be able to predict the extreme. That requires a probabilistic approach. Um, we might need to also worry about fatigue problems because these devices are being exposed to many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of cycles from the waves and from the wind. So we need to understand about uh, you know, the, this very harsh environment. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the core research and, and some of the flex funds, not in a huge amount of detail. That can be obtained from, from the website. I'm going to focus here on, on work at Plymouth, uh, which is looking at the design of, of three different devices. Um, which are shown here. The first is a sort of point absorber where we have uh, some um, floating type structure at the top connected to the ground and, and the, the relative motion between the two parts leads to the energy generation. We've got a, some sort of hinged device here where the relative, this is looking from the top, where the relative to motion of the two parts leads to the energy generation. And then we've got the floating wind uh, device. And so, the idea is to look at these different devices that they've been selected in collaboration with industry and other partners. And we're, what we're trying to do is assess performance under extreme conditions and in particular here, extreme waves and understand, for example, what are the loads in the mooring lines or in this in this connection here so that we can design the system to survive for the 25 or 30 years. Before we can do that, um, we obviously need to understand a little bit more about the site. So Beth talked about the environmental conditions. We need to translate that into some sort of engineering model of the site. And in particular, we might want to know what are the wave heights at that site uh, and what is the period between, for example, the, the crest of the waves or the trough of the waves. Um, and then we might want to know that over you know, 30, 40 years so that we can design the system appropriately. So here is a, a plot of wave height against period uh, for site, the EMAC site, uh, showing the results of a model that produces um, the, 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 the combination of wave height and period for uh, many years. What we want to try and do is estimate, for example, what is the 50 year uh, you know, extreme event, and that is given uh, by this contour uh, here in green, which shows that the likely distribution of wave heights and periods for a 50 year event. And actually what we really want is the most extreme bit, and that's given by this bit here. And so we could uh, use this as input into the design. We can take that information and look at how we can create a, a design wave to speed up the design. We don't want to simulate you know, 50 years of data. We want to simulate simply the event around the design extreme event. And there are a number of different techniques that have been developed, um, you know, mathematical techniques listed here. So we can take that sort of information. And, and for example, if we can use and develop these uh, sort of um, synthesized extreme events, we can move away from having to simulate irregular waves in which we have extreme events embedded. And you can see here, this is a sort of a wave elevation over um, 
maybe nine or 10 minutes, uh, we can try to create from a mathematical model um, a representation of those extreme events and then embed that into a random background of, of wave heights to create a much shorter subset of, of the uh, wave elevation, which gives us the extreme event from which we can then uh, carry out many, many experiments or numerical simulations of that extreme event to, do, to develop the appropriate statistics so that we can understand statistically the performance of these designs. And so uh, at Plymouth, they, they have uh, laboratory experiments ongoing where they are simulating. Here you can see at the top right the, the uh, point absorber and some extreme waves being generated. The, the middle one is the raft. And also there's um, uh, numerical simulations ongoing. And the whole point is to, to synthesize all this information into design recommendations for the industry. From this, these types of experiments and simulations, we can get information on the mooring loads. Uh, and so colleagues at, at Southampton are doing a lot of work on development of new theor theoretical models into anchoring systems. So these are in, in systems in which you embed the anchor in the ground. Uh, my colleagues have, have developed a new idea uh, for improved understanding of, of how these anchors can carry load. And uh, this leads to a, a, a more, a, an increase in capacity compared to previous understanding. And also, um, if we take account of the whole life of loading of the system, uh, we can start to see that you might get benefits from this, the, the sort of repeated loading that occurs on the foundation, that you start to strengthen up the system. And so that can be beneficial for us. All of this then gets embedded into simple mechanical type systems that allow us to develop a, a simple analytical model that can be built into a uh, numerical calculation or simplified numerical calculation. Other work, uh, this time from the University of Oxford, working with Imperial College London, we've been carrying out some large scale field testing uh, for a number of years. And through some funds available from the, uh, the RRE hub, we've been able to extend that program of work. Uh, the, this type of work costs a lot of money, millions of pounds. We've been able to extend that type of work to explore uh, cyclic loading on the foundation. So you, this just shows some examples. These, these are the, the piled foundations that are being installed. This is a detail of the experimental work. It's very complicated, involves big forces up to uh, you know, ma many, many tons of, of load being applied. Uh, here are some cycles being applied to our foundation. So I'll finish off with the Flex Fund projects. Um, there's a range of these smaller scale projects looking at extremes of load, novel devices, fatigue calculations, foundation design, um, building on, on some of the other work, um, and also new techniques for estimating the, the performance of uh, foundations during installation and the early career researcher projects um, actually looking much more at novel devices uh, and trying to develop new ideas around uh, that generation of energy. So I, I'll finish there and thank you very much for, for listening. OK, thank you very much, Byron, and thank you to all the speakers for some really great presentations there. Um, I think I'll, I'll invite the speakers all to join me on the panel now. Uh, if you could put your cameras on and, and unmute the microphones and then we've got a little bit of time. We've got about 10 minutes um, where we can take some questions um, from the floor. <coughs> we, <coughs> excuse me, we have had some problems with, we are still having some problems with the chat. So although it looks like uh, some people are able to put comments into the chat. So if you do have questions, please please put them to the chat or please do uh, email them to the Supergen email address. I think you can see from uh, the presentations there the range of, of the research that's active across the uh, DORE hub uh, and also a lot of that research is, is, is applicable across um, a range of, of uh, technologies, so not applicable across offshore wind and, uh, and wave and tidal in some cases. Um, 
And it's really great to see the, the early career research uh, ideas coming through as well. Some of those very, very innovative. So I'd like to uh, sort of start off the discussion really with um, a question for the panel, which is around the, the, the context of these uh, this conference that we're running at the moment around uh, COP26 and the opportunity and the challenge, if you like, of, of uh, international leadership that the UK has at the moment uh, and the opportunity to make a, um, a, a real uh, statement or to make some real advances and some significant uh, opportunities to, to make a change and to help our uh, global uh, aspirations towards um, the, the very, very critical and very uh, immediate moves that we need to make towards getting to net zero. Um, so what are the key messages that we need to be promoting here, do you think, in offshore renewable energy, given where we are, where we've got to and what the challenges really are? Um, so I think, I, I mean, I'd like to put that question to, to everyone on the panel, really. I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that we all need to be thinking about. Um, shall I go first to you, Beth? Are you happy to, to start off with that? Sure, I can do that. I think what, what brings to mind and um, what you've seen in these presentations is the whole systems approach. I think uh, the Supergen group has been absolutely unique in looking at across all of the different uh, types of instrumentation, but then trying to put it in the round in terms of the environment and also the financial aspects and jobs. And I think that is what really needs to be the message uh, for net zero. Um, you'll see it in a lot of other aspects, the idea of just transition. You can't have a just transition unless you understand all aspects of what's going on. And therefore, this whole systems approach that we've had within the Supergen and that we've um, the ECRs and the flexible funds have also represented has, I think, been really beneficial. And hopefully it's an example to the world of how to do it, thinking in the round, thinking ahead, um, getting everybody involved. OK, thank you very much, Beth. Yeah, absolutely. And the whole systems approach we're taking here uh, it, it is is really important part of that, thinking about all of the different uh, actors and as aspects and interactions that offshore renewable energy will have. Of course, a lot of that is is unknown and we need to project and predict into the future. And that's why we've got so much focus on those predictive models and, and uh, co connecting those different models together. Um, Richard, can we go to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's um, the offshore renewable um, activity and um, academic and industrial activity in the UK has been at the forefront um, uh, intellectually for, for, for quite a long time. And we've, and we've had great leadership in these areas. Um, and it's time to sort of, uh, to sort of export some of that as well. Um, and I think a couple of really important aspects about this is actually the um, the training of individuals and the training of people. So we're very active in this in this whole network uh, network with the early career researchers, and that's pulling people through and training you know, tomorrow's researchers, tomorrow's engineers, and these are and, and and these are the people that are going to be able to take these things out, not just within the UK but around the world, and try and actually uh, implement um, some of the exciting um, and innovative science that's coming out of our, our research, not just in the UK but wider. I think the other thing that comes off very strongly, I um, mean, the way all our challenges are interconnected. I mean, this, these are engineering problems, perhaps like no others. They are so interconnected and so multidisciplinary, not just in the engineering, but into the environment and the ecology and everything else and policy and, 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 and societal aspects that it reinforces the, the need for collaboration at all, at all levels. Um, not just in, 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 in modelling, but in testing and policy development. And I think we've got really got a strong role to play in those areas and, 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 and I've got a good track record in those areas about setting um, the, uh, the policy and the agenda internationally. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and there'll be more discussion on the policy side later on in the session this afternoon. And I think, you know, collaboration obviously within Within our area, there's there's an enormous uh, amount of collaboration to be done, but also across the supergens. And again, you know that this this uh, conference is a good example of that. Um, so let's go to um, Fergal next. Yeah, sure. Um, just echoing what uh, what Beth and and Richard have said, I'll just add to this is that 
I, I want to, you know, I, I suppose um, underscore both the scale of the challenge that lies ahead, but also the absolute urgency. Um, I don't want anybody to get um, the view that we're there or that we've, um, you know, we've, we've cracked it and that uh, net zero, you know, is, is necessarily achievable within the, um, uh, the timescale set. I think we have to take the message and we have to give the message, I think, very much that the noises that are being made by governments, um, our, our own governments, uh, both um, UK national and, and uh, devolved governments, are all um, very positive. It's now incumbent on us, the scientific community, our engineers and, and scientists, to just get on with it, and we've got to, you know, uh, uh, you know, we've got to give credit to UKRI, EPSRC for, you know, funding this initiative. I, th I, I you know, I, I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, we we have reached out, we are re reaching out, and, and and showing that thought leadership. But I'm hoping that audience is, is getting the message that. We're, we're we're open and inclusive, and we just we 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 not just need everybody here to contribute. We need this ten, you know, a thousand times, three orders of magnitude more than what we're doing at the moment. And so there is no real competition in here, but it's it's all hands on deck, and we need the brightest and best people to join in. Truly exciting as well, um, for a truly exciting period ahead. But um, you know, it you know, I, I am. And I'm, I'm not going to apologize uh, uh, about this. I'm scared. You know, um, the, the numbers are huge and, uh, and, and, and we have to get on. The, the solution is not wind or wave or tidal or bio or whatever. It's all of the above. We need everything together and we need it at enormous scale. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, Fergal. That that uh, that importance of diversity uh, across all of our thinking actually is important, but certainly within the energy mix of the future, we can't rule anything out. We need to keep everything in the mix. Um, OK, Zhao, Zhao Wei, would you like to add anything? Oh, OK, um, I, I think the um, cross uh, Cyprian hub collabor uh, collaboration is very important. In addition to this uh, joint events, more joint uh, research collaboration uh, will be great. This can help us to understand each other's work so that we can have a whole system uh, view. OK, yeah, absolutely. And it's collaboration across disciplines, it's a collaboration across sectors, and it's collaboration internationally and, and across uh, academia and industry. Um, Byron, would you like to? Well, I mean, everyone said uh, quite a lot of things that I very much agree with. I mean, it is a colossal problem that we're trying to solve. And it is a problem which you know, engineers can make a huge contribution to solving, particularly in the area that we're working in, which is ORE. But we do need more people. It, it's, it's just the scale of what we are trying to solve requires a lot of very skilled and technically knowledgeable people who appreciate the multidisciplinarity of the problem. And I think that's that to me is the key. Um, I mean, I think yeah, that there is obviously this fantastic opportunity. It's really exciting area to work in. It, it really should appeal to the next generation of uh, university students. And, but we need these people to come into the sector, not just in the UK, but across Europe and across the world. Um, we have a great base, but I think we, we, we can't be complacent. We have to really you know, move it forward at great pace. And, and take the momentum and, and that may require quite a bit of investment by governments and taking a bit of a leap. I think in areas, you know, wind has momentum. Uh, you know, there are viable uh, technologies that are being deployed and but, you know, still there's innovation required there, particularly in floating. Uh, but areas like wave and tidal need a bit of a, a sort of leap of faith, uh, an investment. And, and we need to encourage people to say, come on, let's get on with it. You know, we've got tools to design things. We can, <clears throat> can, you know, connect them up. We've just got to get on with actually building a lot of these devices, you know, around the world and getting experience in the field so that we can then rapidly deploy into the future. Okay. That would be my message. Thank you very much. I think that that's a really uh, great uh, set of responses there and answers. And I think that's that's really covered the, the position. You know, it's a very, very exciting area. Um, we've made some excellent progress, but we're not there yet. 
and uh, there's a lot more that needs to be done uh, both on the technology side but also very importantly looking at the uh, the environmental and ecological interactions as well and what that looks like in the future okay um and i think a very very strong message there around training and also around collaboration very broadly uh, and, and of course around diversity um, in the energy mix and also in the workforce okay well thank you very much we are um we're just over time so i'd just like to thank you the panel very much indeed uh for your your presentations and the discussion today i'm sorry that we haven't had a very effective chat um, but I hope uh, function that is, but I hope that um, you've enjoyed the session and I just like to mention the other sessions we've got this morning. So we've got the energy network session, which starts at 1045. Um, then we have the super solar hub session, which starts at one o'clock today. And then this afternoon at 2.30, uh, we have the policy section uh, session. And I look forward to, to seeing everybody uh, in the other sessions today. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.